so the SSPX are in fact in schism and they are not part of the Catholic Church in a sense. I mean, some people will say they're not in schism. Others will say they're in partial communion. Um, there's many. Why did the SSPX and other uh, adherents say there's no schism or, you know, they they are in communion or partial communion? And why does the church say that they are in schism? It's yes. kind of a, you see, they have both sides going on. That's right. Yes. So what what happened was, of course, is that the society came up with a false definition of schism. Uh, because it's very easy. It's a fine line between her- the the schism, which is the rejection of the authority of the sovereign pontiff and refusing communion with those subject to him. And then heresy uh, with regards to papal primacy or papal infallibility, which is a rejection of the, the dogma of the papacy itself. Right. Uh, and so, of course, if you if you withdraw from authority, the chances are you don't fully believe or you at least have a practical rejection or repudiation of the authority of the Pope, as it was expressed in, in Vatican I and earlier, uh, or if you reject the authority of the Pope in principle and, and as the doctrine, you're probably going to withdraw from submission to him as well. So the two go hand in hand. And St. Thomas Aquinas, following St. Augustine and St. Jerome, says that heresy uh, is usually followed by a break with the church, a schism. And schism usually fabricates a heresy to justify its separation from the church. So these two often go hand in hand. And so what the the, the Society of St. Pius X says is we don't reject the Pope. We accept the authority of the Pope in principle. Uh, and we pray for him in the Mass. And we uh, commemorate him in the Mass. And we, uh, and you know, all of these different things we, we do. But, uh, but you see that... <laughs> Just because they don't reject uh, the Pope, the person of the Pope, and they say he has a, his authority in principle, they still comp- he he does he has no role in the in the governance of the society, in the common faith, because they reject uh, the developments that happened at the Second Vatican Council, and they reject the reforms that followed them, uh, even going so far as to reject the new rite of Mass as evil and harmful to your faith and sinful to attend. And uh, they also uh, have continued to withdraw obedience. They set up their own canonical courts. Uh, They make their own decisions with regards to liturgy and and governance. So they, in in practice, they live a separate life from the Pope and they only listen, or they only interact with local bishops, which again is a part of the extension of the Pope's authority, as well as having their own apostolic authority as bishops. So that in itself is also part of the horizontal aspect of schism that they're offending against, refusal to interact with local bishops, actually coming in to their dioceses and setting up rival altars, rival chapels. Um, and then also refusing to worship with other Catholics according to approved rites. That's a refusal of communion with regards to worship. Um, so you see there, there's a there's an offense on the horizontal level as well as the vertical level of of not of refusing submission to the Roman pontiff. And just so we can clarify this, uh, let me read uh, this brief quote from uh, a treatise that was written by a canonist. Uh, Father Ignatius Zal, it, it's entitled The Communication of Catholics with Schismatics. And he gives a definition in here. And this is the classic definition. And it shows that the society has, again, found refuge in ambiguity and confusion in order to, um, to try to justify their position and to defend themselves from the, 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 um, the charge of schism. But he says here uh, that schism... Uh, is one or a schismatic is one who has received baptism and still retains the name of Christian and nevertheless refuses obedience to the Supreme Pontiff or refuses to communicate with those members of the church who are subject to him. There is here involved no denial of any article of divine or Catholic faith. Strictly considered, a schismatic professes belief in the sovereign power and primacy of the Pope, but out of malice refuses to be subject to him and to obey him as head of the church and the vicar of Christ on earth. Such schism is called pure schism. And again, so remember we were talking about there's also mixed schism, which is more common, which usually is accompanied by a heresy. Um, but right now we're just talking about schism, right? So then he goes on to give these criteria. So to constitute the delect of schism in the strict sense, the following conditions are required. One, one must withdraw directly, expressly, or indirectly by means of one's actions. 
from obedience to the Roman pontiff and separate oneself from ecclesiastical communion with the rest of the faithful, even though one does not join a separate schismatical set. And the withdrawal must be made in relation to those things by which the unity of the church are constituted, which again is faith, uh, worship, and governance. Uh, so you see um, that he says right here that it is not necessary in order uh, to be a schismatic, in order to be guilty of schism, to reject the authority of the Pope in principle. That is that is not necessary because the Pope has two primacies as defined in Vatican I. He has a primacy of truth, a primacy of faith in his teaching authority, and that's of infallibility is the corollary to that that primacy. And then he also has a primacy of charity, right? A primacy of love. And that has to do with the regulation of worship in the church, as well as the practical governance. And papal primacy is a dogma. It is a dogma that no Catholic can reject without endangerment to faith and salvation. Uh, and that is, again, separate from infallibility, separate from the exercise of infallibility. Infallibility and indefectibility are the protections that enable us to be able to submit to these twofold primacies, the primacy of faith, which is the submission of our intellect, and the primacy of love, which is the submission to our, uh, our will. This is Roman Catholicism, and, and, and you cannot reject it, but the society in principle have, and this is why they have had, they've had to come up and fabricate a false definition of schism, which does not actually fit the classic definition. And it doesn't agree with the church's definition. Like they That's almost. Right. <laughs> That's exactly right. And the church has actually used multiple times um, the the word schism from the very beginning. There was that official declaration, like I brought up, Ecclesia de Afflicta, uh, by Pope Saint John Paul II, um, and he says here, "quote In itself, this act was one of disobedience to the Roman Pontiff in a very grave matter and supreme importance for the unity of the church." such as the ordination of bishops whereby apostolic succession is sacramentally perpetuated. Hence, such disobedience, which implies in practice the rejection of the Roman primacy, constitutes a schismatic act. In the present circumstances, I wish especially to make an appeal both solemn and heartfelt, paternal and fraternal, to all those who until now have been linked in various ways to the movement of Archbishop Lefebvre, that they may fulfill the grave duty of remaining united to the Vicar of Christ in the unity of the Catholic Church, and of ceasing their support in any way for the movement. Everyone should be aware that formal adherence to the schism is a grave offense against God and carries the penalty of excommunication decreed by the church's law, close quote. So you see, it's very clear. And this declaration has never been rescinded. As a matter of fact, this society's schismatic stance has been confirmed by both Pope Benedict XVI in his letter accompanying Samorum Pontificum, as well as Pope Francis in his letter accompanying Traditionis Custodes. I also was thinking of uh, Pope Benedict's motto proprio as well, um, when he was talking about how they were excommunicated. And he says that, and even today, he says the doctrinal questions remain. And until they are clarified within the society, they have no canonical status in the church and their ministers cannot legitimately exercise any ministry. And he goes on to say, they yes. basically, they have no active ministry. And until they fix their heresies and refusal to submit to Rome, it's always going to be that way. That's I mean, right. That seems pretty, pretty clear to me. That was yeah. the most last authoritative statement on the matter. And nothing has changed as far as I know. I mean, some no. people say that you know, uh, Pope Francis, you know, gave them, you know, faculty or uh, sacraments and has allowed them to practice and such. So some people think, well, maybe he's changed that, you know, maybe he's reversed that and said it's okay for the SSPX to be doing what they're doing. Is is that accurate? I mean, is there truth to that? No, it's it's not accurate. As a matter of fact, it goes completely contrary to what Pope Francis himself said in his apostolic letter, Misericordia et Misera. Uh, in which he he explicitly states that this is a gesture of mercy, similar to the lifting of the excommunication, which is meant to draw back the the priests and bishops and adherents of the SSPX back into full communion of the church. He explicitly states, as a matter of fact, why don't I read it so people can uh, can hear it? So Pope Francis, again, this is Misericordia at Misera. He says, quote, for the pastoral benefit of these faithful and trusting the goodwill of the priests of the SSPX to strive with God's help for the recovery of full communion with the Catholic Church, I have personally decided to extend this faculty beyond the Jubilee year. 
close quote. So, so you see, again, this gesture was an act of mercy. It's an act of grace. And the church has a history of allowing this. And having faculties uh, does not itself uh, mean that there is no schism. Uh, and the Orthodox are a perfect example of this. They exactly. have faculties to be able to witness marriages and hear confessions, but they are still in schism. And I would also argue that a large portion of the German church and hierarchy is also in schism mm -hmm. uh, with the, the Pope, even though they still retain these faculties at the moment for the time being. So uh, having faculties, and, and, and here's another example that I like to give people uh, that, that shows that the extension of faculties for the good of souls by the church is actually not something that's novel. Uh, and is, it is also not a reflection on the status of the one who is given the faculties. So it's classic uh, Catholic uh, teaching in, in, the, in canon law that a priest who has even been defrocked and suspended is allowed to offer the sacraments of, uh, uh, of the extreme unction and to exercise that ministry and to hear the confession of a dying person uh, in the name of the church. And that, that extension of that faculty, again, is for the good of that soul, but it does not reflect on the status of that priest because, again, he has been defrocked. He, he might not even profess the, the true faith anymore. Um, so you see there's a precedent for this. Exactly. And I remember Pope Francis, when he was talking about this, when this whole thing first came up, I remember Pope Francis specifically said that this does not change anything. This does not change the status of the society. And that's clear. And yet I hear all the time, oh, well, Pope Francis did this. Pope Fran These people are attacking Pope Francis 24 seven. And then all of a sudden it's convenient for them to, you know, <laughs> use Pope Francis as yeah. from their view. Has he ever said anything right? And now, oh, well, he's he's infallible yeah. in this. You know, it's, 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 it's kind no, of funny. It's, it's classic picking and choosing of, of what they want to hear. They, they, they take what they want to hear, but then they reject anything that they don't want to. And Pope Francis himself has acknowledged that it was a schism. And again, like I said, in his letter accompanying Traditionis Custodes, he said, quote, the faculty to use the 1962 missile granted by the indult of the Congregation for Divine Worship in 1984 and confirmed by St. John Paul II in the Motu Proprio Ecclesia Dei in 1988 was above all motivated by the desire to foster the healing of the schism with the movement of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, close quote. So you see he's still upholding the declaration of schism. Uh, that was made by Pope St. John Paul II. Nothing has changed. This, this, this declaration of schism has never been abrogated or rescinded. And I would challenge anyone to present to me any kind of official documentation uh, proving otherwise. Yeah. And, you know, the SSBX kind of have the same problem that City of Acontis do in the sense that, you know, they know better than the church. They have all their own reasons for knowing everything. And you had mentioned canon law and, um, you know, it's very interesting that they try, oh, well, you know, Taylor Marshall does this all the time. Like, oh, well, canon law says this and canon law says you're not the interpreter of canon law, Mr. Marshall, and neither are the SSPX. Mm -hmm. If you try to supersede the authority of the church on canon law, you just can't do it. The church is the yeah. final authority. And they they quote that. Yes, that's right. And, and, and it's actually in canon law that the Pope is the supreme interpreter and legislator of the laws themselves. Exactly. As a matter of fact, all of their authorities flow from his uh, his own ultimate and apostolic authority. And, and so if your interpretation of the law differs with the Pope, guess who wins in the end, right? Uh, so uh, the, it's just, again, they try to find refuge in the, in, in the intricacy and, uh, um, and ambiguities of canon law in order to try to make their case. I mean, it's very, it's like the classic Philadelphia lawyer, you know, approach of, of trying to create, muddy the waters and create confusion uh, so that it's, and that's one of the reasons why I, to, to this day, people are so confused about the status of the Society of St. Pius X is because of the lies and falsehoods that they have concocted in order to distance themselves from the accusation.